Hello, my friends, and welcome as we start a new sermon series on the book of Daniel. We're going to be focusing on the portion of the book that is more about the story and the experiences Daniel had, not so much the prophecies. But there's so much to be gleaned from these first six chapters of the book of Daniel. So we're going to be taking them kind of a chapter at a time, a chunk at a time, and just looking at what we can learn from the story of Daniel and how he and his friends honor God in spite of their circumstances. So before we dive into Daniel chapter one, we bow your heads with me as we pray. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you and just Lord, we just want to give you all the glory for who you are and what you are doing in our lives. Lord, as we are diving into your word today, I just pray right now that you will be honored because of the time that you will help us to experience you, to see you more fully and to understand you more clearly. Lord, because of our time with you today, I just pray that you will show us how we can further honor you with our lives. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come today. We pray that you will speak to us as we dive into your word. We love you so very much. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start reading in Daniel chapter 1 in verse 1. It says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, my friends, we're just going to stop at verse 1 because I want you to imagine you are in Jerusalem at this time. How would you feel when Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian armies have come and surrounded Jerusalem? What would you be thinking? What would you be praying? What would your hopes be? I don't know about you, but I would be praying, Lord, please save us. Please rescue us. Don't let us be taken captive. Don't let Jerusalem fall, Lord. We are your people. This is your city. Please protect us. I'm sure that they were just pleading their hearts out, asking for God to rescue them. Unfortunately, God had been speaking to his people for years year after year after year, ever since he brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, he had told them, if you obey me, then I will be your God and you'll be my people and I'll take care of you. But if you don't obey me, if you disobey me, if you turn to other gods, then I'm going to allow people to come and conquer your lands. In fact, Jeremiah said that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the people were going to be taken captive and there would be a 70 year period that it was going to lie desolate before the people would be able to return back. And so this prophecy was out there. And unfortunately, God's people are not being obedient to God. They have not surrendered and lived wholeheartedly for him. Despite that, there are always a remnant. There's always a few that are still honoring God. So I can imagine Daniel and his friends and his family and everyone in Jerusalem are praying, God, please rescue us. But sometimes God has other plans. He sees a picture that is bigger than ours. He understands things differently than we understand them. And he has purposes for what he's doing. So in verse 2, it says, The Lord gave him, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. It's really important for us to understand at the very beginning of this book that it says God permitted Nebuchadnezzar to take captives from Jerusalem to kind of overthrow the city. Not only that, but God permits him to take a whole bunch of the treasures that would have been from the temple in Jerusalem and some of the treasures in the city. And he allows Nebuchadnezzar to take these things. Now, back then in the understanding, there was very much an understanding that gods inhabited different nations and different lands. So the God of Judah and Jerusalem inhabited Jerusalem and the God of Marduk and was the God, main God of Babylon, he inhabited the lands of Babylonia. And so therefore, when the two armies would fight, whichever army won, it was seen as their God was stronger and bigger. And so we're going to see this theme kind of run through the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he's bigger, he's stronger, he's smarter. But it's important for us to understand at the very get-go, even though all of these things happen, which seem to be disastrous for the people of Jerusalem and Judah, God permits it. God permits it because his people hadn't been obedient. God permits it because he has all other plans that we can't wrap our heads around. But God allows Nebuchadnezzar to think he's one and he's done this on his own might. We're going to see a lot of the journey that Nebuchadnezzar takes also as we go through the book of Daniel. But it's important to understand this as we get going. So if you are one of the people who is living in Judah, Jerusalem, and all of a sudden the armies get in, I imagine they just feel defeated and deflated. 
I know sometimes when we pray for things, especially when I pray for things, and I have a very specific idea on what the answer to prayer should be, and it doesn't go that way, it's easy to feel like maybe God doesn't care. It's easy to feel like, you know, maybe I heard God wrong, or maybe something is happening. But we need to understand that God walks with us not only in the good times, but also in the hard times. That God has said the people as a whole weren't following him, and so the consequences was going to be he was going to allow them to be attacked by different countries. And Jeremiah had said this was going to happen. God has a plan and a purpose in this. But I imagine the people are absolutely devastated. If you keep reading to verse 3, it says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong and healthy, good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they're all versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them to a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from all of the tribe of Judah. The chief staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was a Meshach, and Azariah was a Bendigo. All right, so now we're getting a little personal. Not just the general people of Judah and Jerusalem are upset. So now we see that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have personally experienced this. They probably have gone through this horrible tragedy of praying and asking God to save them. And despite all their prayers, the answer was no. And I can only imagine what their minds were thinking as they walked the 500 to 900 miles, depending upon which route you took from Jerusalem to Babylon. When they walked that journey to Babylon, going into captivity wondering what life was going to be like as they're heading into a pagan land and I can only imagine as they're in Babylon what they are thinking well then they get chosen and it seems that they've been chosen for something really good the best possible outcome at least if you're a captive they've been chosen to go to school and to be trained in all the ways of Babylon and the Babylonian languages and all the arts and have all the modern sciences now this was a very intentional tactic that Babylon used and many other countries at the time used. They would take members from the royal family and indoctrinate them and make them loyal to the conquering nation, in this instance to Babylon. And then when they would need a new king or if they're the king that they had left in charge of the land before revolted, they could send back somebody from the royal line who would be accepted by the people there, but who now had sympathies for Babylon. And not only that, Babylon was known for collecting the best and the brightest, the most intelligent people from all the lands it conquered to be part of the government itself. And so as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are marched into Babylon, I'm sure they have absolutely no idea what is in store for them. And when they get there, this is the best possible reality. This is the absolutely best situation that they could be in because they're not just going to be sold on the auction block. They're not servants somewhere. They're actually going to be trained and they're going to be um, put in school and then they're going to be able to be part of the royal government. Now with this, there's a few things that probably wouldn't have been all that great. First of all, it says that the king ordered Ashpenash, the chief of staff, Ashpenaz, the chief of staff, he is basically the king's closest confidant. That's what the chief of staff actually means. But it also says in the original language that he is the head of the eunuchs. We don't know for a fact that Daniel was a eunuch, but if you look at Babylonian paintings, most of the royal officials that are around the kings in the Babylonian paintings um, are men who don't have facial hair in the depictions, they very much look like they probably were physical eunuchs. There are men with facial hair and stuff there as well. So that doesn't mean that Daniel necessarily was a eunuch. So in Isaiah 39, seven, Isaiah prophesies that some of Hezekiah's own descendants would become eunuchs in the court in Babylon. So many people believe that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually became eunuchs. This would have meant that their dreams, their hopes for becoming parent 
having a descendant, a lineage of their own was completely shut off. So all of the hopes and dreams that they probably had as young men who were royalty in Judah and Jerusalem in Babylon are dashed to pieces. First of all, they're no longer with their families. They've been taken from their families and they're young men. It tells us in some of the Babylonian literature that in order to serve in the court of the king, you had to be at least 17 years old. So the fact that they're called young men, they're probably when they first show up younger, but by the time they reach the finishing school age, they're at least 17, 18. So they're in their late teen years when they're taken from their homes and their families. So they had a they had grown up as royalty, they would have had a privileged life and they probably would have expected to have a really good life, a life of ease, that things would have gone their way. But now in Babylon, they have no choices over what they can do and what they can't do. They are most likely made eunuchs. They now aren't able to even have families and they're not able to have descendants. And this was a really important thing. In fact, in Isaiah, it tells us that God accepts the eunuch and he's gonna give them a heritage. He's going to give them a name. He's going to give them a reputation. In the Jewish thinking, it was such a dishonor for you to not have a legacy. And so to be made a eunuch would have been horrible for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the king has chosen them. And why has the king chosen them? He has chosen them because they are handsome and because they are smart and because they are royal. And so what is, what is the first order of business that Ashpenaz does? Who is the king's most trusted confidant? What does Ashpenaz do? He renames them. And why does he rename them? Well, in Jewish culture, as well as many cultures back then, names are really important. They signified your character. They were like a prediction about your life, which is why Jacob was called a heel grabber or a liar, and God changes his name to Israel. And so when we look at the names, there's very intentional reasons why why their names are changed. So Daniel means my God is my judge, but his name is changed to Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar means Bel protects the king's life. Daniel, whose name means my God is judge, my God is the one who's watching my life, he's going to watch over me. His name is now may Bel, this foreign pagan God, protect the king's life. So Hananiah's name is changed to Shadrach and Mishael's name is changed to Meshach. Both of these names are unclear. They're, we're not sure the description or what they mean, but we know that the king wanted to change their names because in changing the name, he had control over who they were. So he's slowly beginning to chip away at these people, trying to re-indoctrinate them and to make them into Babylonians who would then serve in his court and they would be fully indoctrinated into all of the ways of Babylon. So it changes their names. So Azariah means Yahweh helps and Abednego means servant of the god Nebo. And so one of the reasons that their names are changed is because all of their Hebrew names were pointing them to a trust and a dependence and a reliance on God. Remember what I said though, when a country overthrew another country or conquered it, it was seen as their God was stronger. The names of at least Daniel and Azariah are changed to honor the gods of Babylon. Most likely Hananiah and Mishael's names meant something similar as well. And so there's this indoctrination thing that is slowly beginning to happen with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their names are changed from their names pointing them to God. Their names are changed in honor of the Babylonian gods. So this is part of the indoctrination that is happening in the schools that is going to take place. The other things that they're supposed to be taught all of the ways of the Babylonians. And while they're in school, the king wants to make sure that they continue to be the handsomest, the uh, most intelligent people around. So he is going to supply them with the best of the best. And that is the food of the king. He is taking food from its own table and he's going to supply the students in school with this food, which would have been seen as a high honor and it showed their place of privilege. Instead of just being captives who are slaves, they are now given this place of honor and privilege, but there's still indoctrination that is happening. But in verse eight, what happens? Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. So he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. So it's really important to understand that Daniel was determined. It doesn't matter that he's been ripped from his home. It doesn't matter that his life is out of his control. He still knows that he has choices. 
his choices could be detrimental in terms of he might lose his life if he really stands for his principles. But Daniel determines that he is not going to defile himself. He is not going to eat the food and the wine that the king provides. Now, why would the food and the wine that king provides be an issue? First of all, the meat from the king's table would not have been butchered according to Levitical dietary customs. And God is very specific in how you take care of your meat because he tells us that you're supposed to drain the blood from the meat because the life is in the blood and it's Jesus' blood that cleanses us. So we, they were not supposed to be eating the blood, but Babylonian butchers most likely were not draining the blood from the meat. And so the meat would have been defiled that way. But also the meat would have been defiled because every portion of meat would have been taken to the temple and sacrificed to the gods. And so it would have been an offering to the gods. So in eating of the meat, they would have been honoring and worshiping the God who blessed the meat, which would have been a Babylonian God. So it's seen as an act of worship to eat this meat. The wine would have led to possibilities of overindulgence and intoxication. Notice that it says Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are four of the captives of Judah. Their names are listed because they are different than the other captives of Judah. So there is this idea that there's a whole bunch of captives, a whole bunch of captives from Judah, as well as captives from other lands that are in this school, and they're all given these opportunities, and they're all giving access to as many delicacies as they want. Sometimes we find it hard to deal with situations when we struggle, when we have a lack of something. So when we have a lack of money or a lack of information or a lack of resources. But the struggle can be just as hard or harder when we have an overabundance of things. And this is probably one of the issues with the wine was that overabundance would ha could have led to intoxication, which would have dulled their senses, their ability to learn. Eating these foods could have also slowed them down. And so Daniel decides that he is not gonna be defiled by the king's food. He makes, he draws a line in the sand. His name is changed and he doesn't have much say over what people call him, but he has say over how he acts and the things he does. And so Daniel is not gonna buy in to this whole indoctrinating process. And so he starts at the very get go and he says, I'm not going to defile myself with this food. I'm not gonna to pretend to honor and to worship the God of Babylon. I am not going to let overindulgence take place. I am not going to get topsy-turvy and just let myself go down this lavish lifestyle, let the pendulum swing really far in an unhealthy direction. He says, I'm not going to defile myself with this food. But notice what Daniel does not do. Daniel does not go and just um, refuse to eat. And Daniel determines not to defile himself, but he goes to the chief of staff. He goes to Ashpenaz. And what happens if we keep reading in verse 9? Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of the Lord my king who has ordered for you to eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So it's really important to notice that Daniel and his friends had already found favor with Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz likes these guys. Why does he like these guys? Most likely like Joseph, when he was in slavery in Potiphar's house and in the dungeon, and he earned favor with Potiphar and the prison warden, it was because of his actions and because of his attitudes, because he served wholeheartedly, because he gave his best and it's all. He was a kind and responsible young man. So most likely that's the same reason that Ashpenaz loves Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has affection for them. They have earned favor in his eyes. But despite the fact that they have earned favor in his eyes, he is still worried about the effects of them not wanting to eat the best food in the land and drink the best wine in the land. He thinks if they don't eat it, that they will become thin and pale. This happens all the time in our world. The world will have one understanding of something, but God has a different understanding of it. So in this situation, Aspenatus thinks if they don't eat the meat and drink the wine, they'll become thin and pale and sickly. But we know that when we honor God with our bodies, when we use temperance, when we eat healthfully, when we get sleep, when we take care of ourselves, that we actually thrive and our health grows. And this is also seen in so many other ways. The world says in order to be happy, you have to be wealthy and you have to be popular and you have to have all the things and you have to keep up with the Joneses. But we know that happiness doesn't come from what we have or what we do, but in a connection and a relationship with God. 
And so Daniel, first he goes to Ashpenaz and he's working the chain of command. He's determined he's not going to defile himself, but he's not being defiant. He is going to trust the process. So he goes to Ashpenaz and Ashpenaz is like, I like you guys a whole lot, but I'm worried that the king will see the effects that this has on you and it's going to be my head. Now this doesn't necessarily mean he would have been beheaded, but he would have been held responsible if the boys didn't perform the way the king expected the boys to perform. And so Ashpenaz says no. And many times when we try to honor God, when we try to make a stand for God and we get pushback, we're like, okay, we tried. I guess we shouldn't do this. We'll have to try something else. But what does Daniel and his friends do in verse 11? Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who eat the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. So what does Daniel do when Ashpenaz says no? He goes to their direct report, so their attendant. So first Daniel starts at the top. He goes to Ashpenaz, who is like the best friend and the confidant and the king, who is in charge of the whole school and everybody. Ashpenaz likes the boys, but he's not willing to risk his job. He's not willing to risk the responsibility to help them out. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go to their direct report, the guy who is directly in charge of taking care of them. And this time they present an option. They say, hey, can you, let's do a test just for 10 days. 10 days, let's see if we just drink water and we eat pulse, which is basically any vegetable or anything made of vegetables. So if we can eat the grains and fruits and vegetables and all of that thing, anything like that, we'll eat all of that and just test us for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, if we look sickly and we look awful, then you make the decision and we'll eat, we'll do whatever you want us to do. But at, at the end of 10 days, things go well, then we can keep eating this way. And the attendant says, you know, this seems logical, we can try this. 10 days was long enough that there would be some difference between the people. He would be able to notice something, either they were getting sicker or they were saying about the same or they were getting better. But it wasn't so far gone that everyone around would notice and it wasn't so long that he couldn't recoup their health. He couldn't get them back on the plan and get them caught back up to their peers. So the assistant agrees to do this. Now, why does Daniel and his friends ask to drink just water and to eat just vegetables or plant-based meal? Does that mean that all of us need to be vegan and we all need to eat this way? Well, it's interesting if we go to Daniel chapter 10 verse 2 Daniel has just had a vision and in Daniel chapter 10 verse 2 and he is really upset so he ends up fasting and here's what it says in Daniel 10 verse 2 when this vision came to me I Daniel had been in mourning for three whole weeks at the time I had eaten no rich food no meat or wine crossed my lips and I used no fragrant lotions until the three weeks had passed all right, so later in the book of Daniel, Daniel is eating meat and he's drinking wine. So why won't Daniel and his friends eat meat and drink wine now? The thing is, is at this point in time when they are in school, they're being fed directly from the king's table. And so for a fact, all of these foods would have been offered to the king. Daniel had no control over the portions, the type of food, whether it was clean food or unclean food, whether it had been prepared appropriately, whether it had been offered to the kings. But later on, after Daniel's out of school, he most likely would have had his own home. He would have gotten a paycheck. He could have gone to the market himself and purchased the food that he wanted to from a kosher butcher, someone who had drained the meat that wouldn't have been sacrificed to the God. So Daniel could buy the appropriate meats. And so when Daniel fast later, he fasts from meat and he fasts from wine. He probably then was drinking wine and we're actually told in Psalms that wine was used as a medicine. And sometimes because the water was so toxic, people would drink wines to just help with all of the toxicities and the other things that were just in the environment. But Daniel wasn't going to do it in excess. He had control over the situation. So when Daniel and his friends decide that they're going to take this 10 day Daniel fast that is going to then last them the duration of their schooling, they do it because they don't have control over the food and they don't want it to appear like they are worshiping the gods of Babylon. They don't want it to appear like they are buying into this culture 
And they are drawing a line in the sand and trying to make a stand for God because he doesn't want to defile himself. And so this isn't necessarily saying that we all need to be vegan and drink only water, but it's telling us that we should draw a line in the sand and make a distinction if something is going to be defiling us. So in other words, if it is going to be pulling us away from God. So if there's a food or if there's a drink or if there's anything that is more important to you than obedience to God, my friends, that is defiling you. But we also need to understand that the dietary principles that God gave us in the Bible are there for our good good and science is now proving all of the dietary principles that the Bible showed us to be the healthiest way to eat. And so if we just follow what God prescribes for us, it's really important. But food is not a salvation issue. But obedience to God when he convicts us is a salvation issue. And Daniel is not willing to let people think that he is going to defile himself by eating something that God has told him not to eat, which is food sacrificed in the wrong way, um, which is food sacrificed to an idol, not butchered the appropriate way. He's not going to be overindulgent with wine. So he tells the attendant, give us 10 days. The attendant agrees to the 10 days and so they just eat vegetables fruits grains and water and what happens after that at verse 15 at the end of 10 days daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had eaten the food assigned by the king so after that the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others so what happens is God honors their decision to honor him. As they are willing to make a stand and not defile themselves, God honors them and it is noticeably different. They are noticeably better nourished. They are smarter, they're clearer headed. The attendant's like, hey, this is going fine. No one's even gonna know. Probably no one really knew that Daniel and his four friends weren't eating what everyone else was eating except for the attendant because he gave permission. But no one was gonna question anything because they're so blessed and smart. They look so good. They look so fit. They're so healthy. And so my friends, if we decide to honor God, like Daniel did, he asked Ashpenaz, Ashpenaz says, no, I'm not gonna do that. So Daniel kept trying and he was going through the channels and he was being polite and he offers an opportunity to test God. God tells us the same thing in Malachi. He says, test me, see if I won't throw open the storehouses of heaven. We are told to test if God will honor his promises, not test if God is God. And so what Daniel does is he's basically saying to his attendant, test, let's test the gods. So Daniel's supposed to be indoctrinated into the gods of Babylon. He's supposed to be understanding their ways. Obviously the God of Babylon was stronger than the God of Judah and Jerusalem. That's why they were captured. But God is the one who permitted it all. And so Daniel's saying, test the gods. Test our God. Our God told us not to do this. Test him, see what happens. And so when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are healthier and stronger and smarter, it is in honor of their God, the one true God, the God of Judah and Jerusalem, Yahweh God. And so this is proof. And so they're allowed to continue to eat this way. And what is the result of this in verse 17? God gave these four young men unusual aptitude for understanding every um, aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. So why exactly does God give them unusual aptitude? Why does he give them special understanding? So in Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable of the talents. In this parable, there's a master who's gonna go away on a long trip. So he gives one servant one talent, another servant two talents, and another servant five talents. Goes away on a trip, and then the servants get to decide what they're gonna do with this money. The first servant buries the money in the ground because he's scared of his master and he's lazy. He doesn't want to do anything with it. The second servant with two talents, he puts the money to work. He invests it, whatever he does, and he ends up earning two more. So he has a total of four. And the guy with five talents, he puts the money to work and he doubles it as well. And he ends up with 10. When the master comes back, he starts with the guy who has 10. He says, well done, good and faithful servants. Um, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. And then the guy who doubled it with four, he said, well done. So it doesn't matter that the one guy had made a bigger return. He had been faithful with what he'd been given. So the master is still happy with him. When he gets to the guy with one talent, that talent that had been buried, the master calls him a wicked and lazy servant and he's thrown out. And his talent is given to the guy who now has 10 talents. 
My friends, I think this is really applicable as we're looking at the story of Daniel and his friends. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have chosen to honor God. They have surrendered their lives to God and they're leaning into that relationship with him. And so God is able to honor their efforts and multiply them. We see this doubling of efforts and this multiplication of talents when we give them to God and we use them for his service. And so as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they're leaning into God and that relationship, God is able to multiply it abundantly and he's able to use them powerfully. So at the end of their schooling, what happens? In verse 18, when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. My friends, isn't that amazing? When Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego drew this line in the sand and said, we are not going to defile ourselves. We're not going to lean in and be indoctrinated into your God and your culture and your way, but we are going to be respectful and we are going to serve where we're planted. We're going to be here and we're going to honor God despite the fact that this isn't our plans for our life, despite that we wouldn't have wanted to be here, despite the fact that you're most likely eunuchs and had to give up their dreams for a whole bunch of stuff, despite the fact that they didn't have control of their training and the education, they still still decided to honor God and they weren't going to lean into the indoctrination. And so because of that, God is able to multiply their gifting 10 times greater than anyone else, all of the wise people in the whole kingdom of Babylon. So anytime the king needed sound advice, he would come to these guys. And we're going to see that through the rest of the book. God is able to be glorified. So God, at the beginning of the chapter, allows Nebuchadnezzar to defeat Jerusalem and to take captives and to take stuff from his temple. And Nebuchadnezzar has this understanding that that means his God is in control and he's bigger and he's stronger. But in the, his very kingdom, in his very school, are these four men that are shining for God. And so God always has a remnant. So despite the fact that the reason God lets Judah and Jerusalem be captured was because the people had been disobedient to God, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had decided, despite what's happening around them in their own country or their current country, that they're going to honor God. And when God sees that type of dedication, he is able to exponentially um, expound on that. He's able to make a huge impact. And because of their influence, the person directly above them at least knows what has happened, that the God of Judah and Jerusalem, because he's being honored, has given them this amazing health and this wisdom and then this knowledge and this capability. And then King Nebuchadnezzar himself, who is the most powerful king in the world at this time, now has four godly men in his kingdom that are the absolute smartest in the world. They're 10 times smarter than anybody else. And despite the fact that Nebuchadnezzar thought his God was bigger, God all through the pages of the book is saying, you, you don't understand. You, you're missing the point. I'm bigger and I'm sending my four here. You might think you captured them, but I sent them. I sent them because they have a purpose and they're going to shine for me. And so my friends, as we look at the story, we need to understand that it doesn't matter whether life is going good or bad. God has a call on our lives and he has called us to live right here and right now for him. He's called us like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to choose not to defile ourselves, but to make a stand for him and to trust him regardless of the consequences. And so my friends, as you are looking at your life today, as you're looking where God has you right now, maybe it's not where you want to be. Maybe it's exactly where you want to be. How can you choose to honor God regardless of the circumstances? How can you lean into the talents God has given you so that he can multiply them tenfold? What does that look like for you? I would love to know. Would you take a moment and grab your connection cards? You can do that by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And let me know, what did God say to you as we were studying Daniel chapter 1? What is What really stands out to you in these stories? Those things that stand out is God speaking to you. And then secondly, how are you going to respond to God? God doesn't just want you to hear him talking. He wants a relationship. He wants a conversation. So he wants you to respond to him. So God spoke to you. Now what are you going to do about it? And lastly, how can we pray for you? We need each other on this journey. Let me pray for you now. 
Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you that you are God, that you are here. We thank you that in spite of the crazy mess that is our world, that you are in it all. And Lord, I thank you that in spite of our circumstances, the good and the bad, the easy and the hard, the things that feel like blessings and the things that feel like don't, that you are with us in them all. And so Lord, I pray that you show us how to make a stand for you, that you will honor our stand for you, that you will use us to share your love in the, to the world around us. And Lord, we just pray that you're, you will come soon and bring us back to heaven. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for studying with us. The sermon would have aired at 6 o'clock on Friday evening. And you can join us for a live discussion of the same passage on Saturday morning at noon. You can join us in two ways, either in person in our building at 14595 Avian Parkway, or you can join us on Zoom for our interactive um, discussion. You can get the Zoom links by texting the word study to 301-321-8848. I hope you have a wonderful day and I look forward to processing this passage with you tomorrow.